Hi there, I'm Danny Henderson. Welcome back to my beautiful Disclosure Planet, disclosing the truths of every system of every corruption on your planet. We're still focusing, we also focus on the beauty, but today we're going to put Lahaina back on the table. As all of those of you aware and awake and alive with a pulse and a heartbeat, you'll remember that August the 8th of 2023, a horrendous, horrific a uh, genocidal fire occurred across Lahaina, one of the most ancient parts of the Hawaiian Islands on the island of Maui. Um, we brought you information from this beautiful man, Alfie Baserta. We'll come to him in a moment. He has done such greatness, such goodness. He ran in and out of the fire. He was looking for people. He was helping save people, getting his own family rescued. This man also has a tiny piece of land that he was gifting for those that had their fires, that their houses burnt in the fire. Alfie was giving them rent-free accommodation to help them because the authorities around them were unable. One of the things that amazes me the most is that the island of Maui is surrounded by the ocean and Lahaina is on the ocean and yet they weren't able to get the water from the ocean and put the fire out. It is one of the most insane abuses of justice on our planet. I welcome with my heart open wide, the beautiful, the one and only, the former policeman, Alfie Baserto. Oh, thank you, Danny. Thanks. Thanks for having me back too. I really appreciate that. Are you kidding? I've been stalking and haranguing you for months, desperate for an update and telling people on my channel, we're putting Lahaina back on the table. Don't you worry. No one's getting away with Jack. We're putting it back on the table. Now, your company is rebuildmaui.org, and you literally were putting up domes and all kinds of different things. Uh, and we'll come back to the fact that people that owned bigger pieces of land than you sued you, and they tried to take that land from you. They weren't able, for whatever reason, to help their brothers and their sisters. They accused you of bringing down the neighborhood. I mean, it's just a horror story when people have lost everything. They had to listen to their animals. They couldn't find their children's animals getting burnt up. I mean, just a horror show. Please give us an idea of what it was like and what's actually been done to help the people of your island. Well, um, man, there has been so many different um, pages to our story since the fire happened, you know, I'll, and, and it's hard to know where to begin, but, you know, I'll start with the, with the land uh, project that we had. So we, we, before the fire, we had owned a piece of land, uh, it was two and a half acres, and it was right above Lahaina. So literally those who are located there that have their homes in this area can look down on the devastation right now, right? It's, it's a gorgeous piece of property. Lahaina is small. So, I mean, you know, anywhere, anywhere um, in Lahaina, you could, you know, reasonably say that you you were in fact affected in some way, but this was so far up the hill that the fire didn't get there. And so we thought it would be a great idea <clears throat> to allow people to bring their tiny homes or trailers or whatever kind of dwelling they had to live on this land for free. Um, and we thought it was a great idea. Um, you know, we thought that we could uh, also put up a couple of homes and just let people live there. We we were calling it midterm housing, where they could live for about a year or or more, just to kind of get back on their feet. Because living in the hotels was really difficult. That those were our our shelters, and you would think that living in a in a hotel on the water here in Maui would be you know pretty fantastic and it was not that and it, it wasn't that they were someone was mean to us or didn't feed us or it wasn't that they're just that i i'm not sure if i shared this on our on our last visit together but it's like it's like going to a bad bar a bad pub right and and you see all the same people and they all complain about the same things and it's a really bad environment for people who are trying to heal because what happens is you you just everyone gathers together and and so the problem with that too is that everyone is justified for complaining and for grumbling they just lost everything right they lost their lives 
but it's not good if you're there surrounded and you're only hearing the same bad stories over and over again. So people are literally losing their minds in that place. There are people who are now on uh, antidepressants who have never been on antidepressants. And, you know, they're talking about how they have, they're still crying every day. You know, it's like I, when this poor mom, she's like, hey, I've never been on any presents. I have to take them every day and I'm still miserable. You know, it's, it's really sad what's happening. So we decided we're going to offer um, our land up. Right. And um, well, uh, we couldn't, we found out we had to slow down on that because we were um, served with a lawsuit where we have our land. It's surrounded by these really um, gorgeous estate homes, right? It's an, it's behind a gate. Um, a lot of these people have, um, you know, they've done a great job financially to put, you know, to, to afford to live there. And, you know, we didn't build anything as we couldn't afford to build anything on this land. It was just two and a half acres, right? It was, we own the smallest piece of land in that area. Some people own 12 acres, seven acres, you know, five acres. So we got this tiny little piece. And we thought it would be a great investment for the future. <clears throat> um, the lawsuit stated that we were Ill illegally attempting to put up uh, tiny homes in an area that wasn't zoned for tiny homes. And and they're true. That's right. It's not right. It's it's not. But we just had a major fire and thousands of homes were lost. We thought it would be the right thing to do. Yes. Um, and, and we were obviously I can't afford to be sued. Um, what's also awful in, um, in my county if you get sued, um, and it, my land was held in um in an LLC, well, I can't represent my LLC. I need an attorney to represent me. So those are additional costs that uh, make it really hard to to navigate. Um, I suspected that these folks who were suing us um, just didn't want, you know, um, in layman's, you just didn't want a bunch of poor people, you know, kind of like mucking up the the their, their area it's super super sad um that it's been several months since uh i've heard anything about the lawsuit it, it hasn't gone away it's just been really quiet so now we're at the point where we're gonna just put up two tiny homes um since we last talk uh talk i've had to uh, you know i used to own three businesses of something i was sharing with you danny and now i've had to also find employment because you can't live on Maui, stay on Maui and do what you used to do. It just doesn't, it doesn't work. We've lost, you know, hundreds of businesses. And so it's a, it's a really, a lot of parents and, and families there, it's a really difficult uh, dance, but I mean, every, everyone, everyone experiences difficulty in life and you just got to, you know, you do what you do and you help those around you and you just keep moving forward. You know, when you talk about the the trauma, you know, the people that living in the hotels because their houses were burnt to the ground um, and, and, and had nowhere else to go but the hotels, it, it's so sad because they're just getting re-triggered. The trauma is just getting re-triggered over and over and over. And it's just like a like Groundhog Day mentally and emotionally. So, of course, these beautiful people are really stuck. And I guess when you feel, I mean, as a therapist, this is what I am surmising here. And, you know, maybe some people are making some progress and something happens and they're seeing somebody completely shell-shocked with severe PTSD, you know, because people died, they lost their animals, they lost their entire lives. There were generations of families living in, you know, wooden structures that they had been for years and years. They'd been grandfathered in, they had been handed down. It was a very unique neighborhood, wasn't it, in, in, in some areas to live. And that Eric guy, I reached out to him, Eric, you know, the real estate guy, who I thought did a wonderful job when it first happened. He was right in there showing everybody is it Hawaii real estates? I forget, but, and I reached out to him several times, say, let's have a catch up, let's have a catch up. Um, but, you know, he's doing his own thing. But this week or last week, I went on his channel to see what he was up to. And he did a, um, he was driving around, he was showing the gym that he used to, you know, work out. And he was showing a place where people used to live, you know, lower, lower income houses. And they're in the same position. There's been no so so tell us so are our rebuilds happening like what is the local authority doing the local government doing so i mean it's been a really slow process just just recently 
Um, I would say most of the burned area has been scraped, right? So they've, they've removed all of the whatever was structures that were there. Most have, okay? Um, have, however, no one is allowed back into that area still. It's still considered uninhabitable. So um, there is a family that I know who wants to return to their to their land because they've got nowhere else to live. You know, they just simply can't afford it. Um, and um, their tenure or their stay at the hotel shelters has ended. And so they said, hey, I got to go back to my land. I've got nowhere else to go. And the county is saying, no, you can't. It's still uninhabitable. Um, and so they are just going to press their luck and go and park there and live there because they've got no other option. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people, you know, some uh, there are a lot of people who don't qualify or even if there was a clerical error, didn't qualify for government assistance, like through FEMA um, or some other organizations, they're out of luck. You know, I mean, I've helped. I had a really, I have a really close friend who I was very, very dear with. And um, we we lived, he actually, we had a, a tiny home on our land before the fire that we lost the tiny home too, but he rented the tiny home from us. Um, for some reason, after the fire, he wasn't, um, he didn't qualify for FEMA, okay, until just recently. So just imagine, it's been almost a year, he just recently qualified, okay? So he's been kind of winging it. Well, after the fire, things really got tough uh, for him. Um, he's he's he has really got had a hard time, and um, the reason I'm kind of stumbling on my words here is because um, I have had to meet with him, um, man, just a, a bunch, a handful of times, and every time it's about he just wants to he wants to end his life. He is just done fighting. He's done having bad news. He's he's just, and it's it's really hard. In in fact, it's I have a difficult time um, extending help because what I've realized, and and my wife pointed it out. It's like you know, she told me she's like Alfie, I can't be around him. It, she's like because it's so much on me. And my wife is trying to get pregnant, and I don't know if you know, but we we lost a we lost a pregnancy right after the fire. Oh, Al. And so now we're still, we're still, we're still trying and you know, we're, we're trying to create an environment, you know, where, where um, it's conducive for, you know, creating babies in life and um, having my friend who, I mean, really, who's one of my best friends on Maui, he is a mess, you know, I mean, uh, he, and he was never like this until after the fire where, you know, he's, he's all, you know, he'll say things like, Hey man, every, I'm, I'm done, you know? Alfie, I'm done. Uh, I don't want to live anymore. Everyone's, um, everyone will be better without me. And, and, and it's just sad seeing what, you know, this man, you know, what's happened to this, this man. And he was one of the most gifted, um, engineers, mechanics, and he can, he can, uh, fabricate anything. And he's an artist. He's, he's got so many skills and, um, He's just been beaten down by by this fire and things that happened after that. I'm so, so sorry that, to hear that. It's just so dreadful. And again, you could say that for probably a few hundred other people who were in that broken, hopeless state, you know, and they still haven't had a moment to recover from the trauma of it. And then from the realization of everything they've lost and then seeing all these people in a zombified state, emotionally frozen paralysis state. I mean, but it's just, it's tragic to hear. It's so sad. The, the help, what kind of help has there been? You know, Maui is a very wealthy island. The American government took over Hawaii. I mean, they forced the last queen of Hawaii to abdicate, otherwise they were gonna kill her followers and her supporters. So the American government came and stole the Hawaiian islands, tried to genocide and decimate the history. And this is all true and listed and written. We know it's not a lie. I wrote a name down, where is it? Queen Lily, Lily Okala Laney. She was the last serving monarch of the Hawaiian kingdom. And along comes the American government. They said, well, have a bit of that. 
and they've done it across the world. Many, many people have done it. The British have done it too. It's, you know, no one hasn't, you know, been affected by bad behaviors. Um, and, you know, I, I, I'm just like listening to you and, you know, catching up here and, and realizing that it doesn't seem like the right kind of help because deep down, Alfie, we know they don't care. The governments, the wealthy, the deletes, you know, the neptards, the retards at the top, they just want it. They want the suffering. They don't care. They want the land. They want the oceanfront properties. Like none of us are stupid. None of us are stupid. And we are talking to it and we are pushing back against it because we are a people of this planet. This is our planet, my planet, your planet, our planet. And we are the ones from this point forward, we take it back. And we decide what's going to happen. And those yellow, yellow livid, whatever they're called, jelly livid, whatever, the most insulting uh, neptards, awful, soulless ones that have come and tried to dictate to the people. No, we don't stand for that. So, Alfie, tell us, what can we do? What do the people of Lahaina need? What help and support do they need? Well, um, you know, housing is still... Uh, something that we are uh, fighting for you know we we haven't had I, I mean we haven't had anything built yet you know it's been a year and there is nothing you know virtually nothing has been erected for for housing for us so we so how we've been uh, addressing that is um, you know, people have been occupying um, Airbnbs, right? That used to be Airbnbs, and FEMA is renting those out. So the, you know, they're they're trying to get creative and move people in there. Um, so we definitely need need housing. It needs to be affordable housing, because right now I'm going to give you an idea. There's on my street right now three houses on my street. Um, two, oh, excuse me, one on my street, and then in this neighborhood, virtually right on the street. Um, are being rented at twenty thousand dollars a month right now, okay. and they just got and they just got rented out. Yeah, twenty grand, insane. But that's what's happening right now, and um, it's super unfortunate. Um, so a lot of families are are realizing they they can't stay here. You know, if you've got if they're moving to other islands, they're moving to the mainland. Um, it's just it's just too difficult. There's only a small class of people that can afford a twenty thousand dollar rent i mean or or you're on complete government assistance because fema is is in some cases paying paying that but what that but what that creates it creates a whole another problem because what happens after fema stops deciding to help that family well they got to go right i mean no one's you know it's just it just doesn't make any sense okay um, so there's housing. And then the other one that people need is a lot of mental health, a lot of, um, I think a lot of trauma, um, you know, therapy, there's something that, um, you know, I, I want to, I kind of want to share something personal. I don't know if it's, um, you know, you can edit this out if you, if you, if you don't want to, if you want it, don't want it in, but I think it might help some people. So if you don't mind, I'd, I'd love to share it. Is that, is that okay? Yes, my darling. Yes, please. So, um, you know, after the fire, um, I would have this impression that a lot of our kids and, and I kept thinking kids, I don't, I don't, I don't, um, ooh, I'm going in emotional already. No. A lot of our kids, uh, You want to stop for a minute? No, no, no. I gotta. I I can. I can. I can do it. I had a I had an impression that a lot of our kids needed some help, um, with everything they're experiencing. Because I kept feeling that a lot of parents um were in crisis, because when you're living in a hotel, or you're trying to make ends meet in a way that's been unique because, you know, I think a lot of people at one point have experienced like financial difficulty. Well, it's very different when you're trying to, um, it's almost as though you're homeless, right? Because you're in this, um, you're in an emergency shelter and you have no idea what tomorrow brings. It, it, it's a, it's a level of anxiety that's just off the charts. 
Mm-hmm. And so parents are, are experiencing this level of anxiety that they've never uh, ever had before. So I'm, I'm thinking like, man, I can't imagine what all these kids are going through because if parents are in crisis, children are in crisis. That's just, you know, almost how it works. Mm-hmm. And, um, well, this fire had a very interesting way. Um, I, we, we started to, I started to uh, really research um, trauma, PTSD, and how that affects us, okay? And um, I'll, I'll share like my personal journey with that was uh, what I discovered about trauma and, and, and uh, is that it's like, it's just like a wound, right? It's just like a, a scuff on your elbow. And it, it never really heals. And so when you scuff that elbow again, because it never healed, it's very sensitive. So for me, and I'm sure a lot, a lot of other folks who've, who've gone through this fire, you know, it, I scuffed my elbow again, right during this fire. And what it did is it made me go back and address. I had a lot of uh, childhood trauma from when I was a very little, very young child, I was sexually abused for years. And I never addressed it. I made. I hoped that it just would go away, right? I didn't want to admit it. And um, it was. I. I, I just. Re- I just was able to put a timeline on it during this re- very recently, and that was. Um, I was uh, in elementary school, so it was like fourth grade, third grade, fifth grade, something like that. You know, I can't really put a perfect time on it. Well, uh, um, so I. I for some reason it the fire brought me back there. And it's because there was this significant trauma. And I started realizing with PTSD, you know, some a study that was fascinating to me was that they studied these military uh, men who would go into, would come back from uh, serving in the military. And one would have PTSD and the other one didn't, but they had the same experiences. They had the same experiences. They had the, they were in the, they were next to each other in some cases, but one had PTSD, one, one didn't. And when they looked deeper, um, the one who had PTSD, there was already an ex- existing trauma that occurred way back, right? Because there's a, it's like a wound. I'm yeah. like, wow, that's interesting, right? And so I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, man, I have this thing in back in the day that I never, re- never addressed, right? With a child, especially a male child, they almost, they almost never uh, admit their sexual abuse because, um, well, shame. You know, in my era, if you were abused by a male who I was, I had a male babysitter who abused me. Um, you know, if you were had if you were sexual with a man in the 80s, you had AIDS. Like that was it. That was the message in America. Like mm-hmm. AIDS, AIDS, AIDS. We probably had more AIDS education as a child than like it was like in, on par with like math. It was that heavy. Like, hey, you know, it, you know, don't do this. You'll get AIDS, AIDS, AIDS. So it was a lot of shame around it. You know, in fact, in the 80s, if you remember, at least in America, the, you couldn't even have gay friends in fear that you would get AIDS. It was so heavy. You know, it was it was it was crazy. Well, so it goes unreported. A lot of boys go unreported, you know, and that's, you know, and that's, I think, a lot of male, um, a lot of male um you know, attackers, abusers would love that, right? So this is this is gonna get somewhere. So what happened is um I started looking back at that and then I realized that um in my adult life I had an issue. Hopefully this helps one of your your viewers. I had an issue that I would be untruthful or I would lie to only women. That's it. I would lie to only women in my relationships. It bugged me. But it bugged it, it 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 really bothered me because I was like, man, Alfie, why do you have to lie to these women? This is crazy. Like, just stop lying. You don't lie to anyone else. Just stop. Okay, I'm trying to figure this out. And, and then um, around COVID, I just I just stopped lying. That's it. Okay, I just stopped lying to every any women any, and I just made a hard fast stop stop stop. Well, after the fire happened, I wanted to lie again. I wanted to have. I just wanted to lie again. I felt it. I could feel it come up. I was like, wow, what is this feeling again? You know, this is interesting. Well, then I heard um, a, a therapist. His name is uh, Gaber Mate, Dr. Gaber Mate. I'm not sure if you, you're familiar yeah. with him. Yes, I am. A therapist. I love, yeah. love his work. He said, um, 
you will, whatever your first experience to love, I'm paraphrasing, to love is as a child, you will always gravitate back to that. So for me, for me, my first experience to love and sex was my sexual abuse. And for me, so when I met my wife, she told me, Alfie, we can do anything you want. She's just like, anything. You want to do, you know, hook up with other people, like be open, whatever. Just don't lie to me. I'll do anything. Because she knew that I had lied in my last relationship. Well, when she told me that, I was like, I felt defeated. I felt deflated. I felt like she had taken something away from me. And I never shared this with her, ever. I was like, why do I feel like that? I should be excited. I have a, a woman who's like, I just love you so much. We can do whatever you want and need. Um, I ended up lying to her, right? Because I couldn't figure this out. And then when I heard Dr. Gabramante share that, I was like, that is fascinating. And what I realized is my first experience to love was secret because I was being abused. But I still kind of enjoyed it, which is the problem. You know, I, I... Even though I was a child, my body responded to it. And that was very shameful too. I was like, why would I enjoy this? You know, it's like I'm being abused. But I, because as a child, I needed someone to love me. I wasn't, I was like, like, like neglected as a child, I felt. And, and, and then here I get some abuser who's like showing me attention now and, and, and showing me love at a time that I really needed it, right? And, um, and so for me, I always had to create a secret sexual relationship. And I and then I realized it was because for years, my first experience to love and sex was secret sexual relationships. And I would always create a secret sexual relationship um, whenever I could. And that made me feel whole. It made me feel loved. It made me feel at peace. When I didn't have it, I was frantic. I was, and I, I would truly feel like I was uh, really unloved. And um, I think, you know, uh, I look at the fire now and it, you know, it's, it was awful, right? I mean, no one can deny that it was terrible, but it, it, um, it made me look at this piece of trauma in my life and um, it helped me, um, you know, arrive at, at make some sense of it, you know? And I know that there's, everyone has their own journey. And I hope that, um, you know, when people hear this, because I, you know, I've shared this um, in a in a classroom once with with adults, and you know, I had a couple of people come up to me later and said, "Hey, I know someone like that. You know, they were abused, and that, and now they they feel like they just have to. They're in the same cycle." And um, yeah. Anyways, that's that's my journey, and 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 because of that, it created this really. Um, we started offering this wonderful um, event for teens. Um, and if, if you'd like, I can tell you now about, yes. you know, uh, I can tell you more about that. And that that's actually what, what inspired, you know, so my journey with, with trauma, um, I started thinking about the, the, the kids here. And so we said, <clears throat> we're like, okay, the kids want, as a teenager, all you want is your own space, right? Your own room, your own things, like that's it. You just want your own identity because it's at that age, your brain starts to feel like I need my own stuff, my own style, my own everything, you know? And, and so we said, okay, we're going to have a party for all of the teenagers on Maui. And I think the one thing we've been, we've failed at for teenagers is we'll say, yeah, this is, this event is for the whole family. You can bring your kids too, or this is for ki little kids. Yeah, but you can come to teenager, but we rarely have something just for teenagers, like specifically for them and only them. So we call this Maui Flow Fest and um, we held it at the Ritz Carlton and um, we we made it semi formal and um, to put it to wrap in a nutshell, what this was, was a mental health initiative that looked like a huge high school dance and what we did is we had about 15 mental health therapists there and they were, they, they, um, they staffed the photo booth. And so if you imagine, we have like 15 of these, these um, therapists there and it's, it's there, they don't engage the kids unless the kids come to go visit the photo booth and there's signage there about, Hey, um, if you need to talk to someone 
you know, if you need to call someone, here's an anonymous phone number. And, and, and now they're interacting in this non-clinical, non-threatening. It's not, if you need help, come to my office and talk to me and I'll therapy you. Not that way. It's like, you know, they're interacting in, in sort of like the kid's natural environment in a playful, fun environment. You know, something else I heard oh, from Gabramate too. It's like all mammals, every mammal in the animal kingdom, humans, whales, cats, dogs, we were all born with this trait of being playful naturally. If you put two kids on the ground, you put two kitty cats on the ground, whatever, they're just going to play naturally. Well, a lot of that has been beaten out of us, right? And so, especially as adults, like to become playful, we'll need alcohol, we need a shot, we need a glass of wine to get playful. So what we did is we 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 brought in all these big, big games. We brought dodgeball, we brought big connect four, big Jenga, big checkers, all these games. We had kick darts so that we wanted to teach kids that you could become playful and, and without the, the alcohol, without the drugs, and and you know and dance and have a great time um and it was beautiful it was it, it worked exactly as planned i and i didn't follow anyone's blueprint no, i mean none of the you know none of this has been done it was it was fabulous it was just like a blessing from above and then we had a luau there and many of our kids who live here and grew up here have never been to a luau so wow. imagine thousands millions of people come to maui every year and many of our kids have never seen a luau oh my gosh it's, it's crazy help? That's so sad to me because that's part of the culture and the heritage. Can you tell people that might not know what a luau is, please? Oh yeah, absolutely. So it's um, so in our culture, and it's a Polynesian culture. So that consists of like the Hawaiian, Tongan, Fijian, Tahiti, uh, Maori, Hawaiian, Samoan, right? And so all those, all of our cultures, it's a it's a cultural dance, right? So every island has its own. Um, its own different types of dances that is specific to that island and that culture. And so Luau is just a display of those dances. You know, they have their own different kind of dress, their own music, and they're beautiful. They're cele celebratory dances, right? And um, and so what I realized, and this was like the day before the actual <laughs> event, I was like, man, you know, I, I would really love to offer a Luau here. And I was like thinking, I was like, I don't know if our kids have, been to Alua. And um and it's really sad. So um we offered one and um and it was beautiful. By the way, all this is free. It was all free for all the kids, right? Mm -hmm. And um and the Luau dancers after they're like, Alfie, this was the most energetic, exciting crowd we've ever performed. This is all they do, by the way. It's like the kids were amazing. Is like we will always, anytime you have an event like this, we'll be back. He's like, we'll, we'll be back. It was beautiful. Um, so, man, I still get choked up. It was such a wonderful night. Okay. So um, we offered the, the games. We offered the luau. What I tell people, it's like bringing therapists and children together. It was like, you know, imagine you have two really good friends who don't know each other, right? You're like, man, Susie is awesome. We love Susie. She's the best. She's single though. And you're like, Dan is also single and he's so awesome. Ah, if they just met, they would be so cool together. So you have a party at your house and you both you invite them both in hopes that they will meet and wonderful things will happen. Mm -hmm. So we knew some therapists and we knew some children and we brought them together in a party so that they can just meet. Mm -hmm. That's 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 what happened at Blowfest. It was beautiful that what happened there. And um we had an opportunity to tell kids like, you know, we had messages all over the, the venue that said, hey, you're enough. Hey, you're loved. Mm -hmm. Hey, you know, it's, you know, someone, you know, you are, it was just, it was so wonderful that, um, so we're, we're actually, we're, we're hosting another one. Um, I, I'm just before this, I was, um, I was in communication with the Ritz Carlton who have been lovely, you know, because some of these other big resorts, they won't even give us the time of day. Like wow. they won't even respond. It's it's crazy. Wow. And the Ritz Carlton, they literally just rolled out the red carpet for us and they said, "Hey, we we really want you here." 
So it's a big shout out to the Ritz Carlton and and couple of they're, they're, they're beautiful people. Yeah. So and go support them. So it is down it's to wonderful. the management. It is down to the people, the local people working there. It isn't always just a cut and dried from corporate. So, but you know, just to kind of highlight, because like you said, other bigger resorts aren't even looking at you. And these are the people on the island. A lot of these people are or were staff members or workers of these different establishments. I mean, Lahaina wasn't the wealthiest area, the bit that was targeted and burnt was it there was a lot of multi-generational families and you know talk of they want the land they want to clear the people out the poor people you know and, and you bless your heart for sharing your very deeply felt you know trauma as a little boy that when the horror the life and death horror because it, as the fire was happening you shared last time in our broadcast together that you would drove your wife and some family members out to a safety place, but had to go back and look for two more of your children, which you found, um, thank goodness. But but no one is ever going to be the exact same again. How could you be? So yes, things that aren't healed, everything gets triggered. You're on survival mode. People are dying, people are missing. So for everyone else, in the like hotel situation, living in that awful Groundhog Day, all their traumas absolutely are going to be right on the surface. I mean, it's just absolutely horrendous. And bless you, turning your pain and trauma into something so beautiful as the Maui Flow Fest. Um, again, inviting people around the world to come get involved, come to Maui, like help the people here. People say, I need a mission. What can I do? Well, hopefully everyone in the world is working on themselves, working on their own healing, because we've never been in the position we are globally, let alone on Lahaina and looking at the genocidal fire that happened. Um, so so you're amazing, Alpha, you truly are. Um, and, and yeah, the Ritz-Carlton, thank you, because it has such a, you know, upper class snooty, they're never going to care. And it's so beautiful that you can actually say no on Maui, this hotel and these people are reaching out and helping their own helping their own, their brothers and their sisters, because that that is what we are. Now, you know, I want to I want to say something about that, because at the, at the Ritz Carlton, it was intentional. I, I want I selected I reached out to these venues that were elevated because I wanted our kids because we, we could have chosen a civic center. We could have chosen some funky park like we could have, you know, that I thought was like, oh, yeah, we can take the kids there. But that wasn't the point. I wanted them to feel special. Right mm. when they arrive, I want them to feel like, oh, wow, this is for me. Like, and it feels foreign because they've never been to an event there. Only we're only allowed to work there. You're not allowed to party there. You know, you know what I'm you know what I mean? Like yes. in many cases, it's that it's that attitude. It's like, hey, you're the help. The help doesn't party here. And so I um, you know, I wanted kids to arrive and at this wonderful uh ballet. And the, the people there were amazing. The valets were were so gracious. And then we had a greeting crew there, you know, that would 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 greet these kids as soon as they get out of their cars. I mean, it was like, and we had we intentionally laid down red carpet for uh, these kids. It was so cool, Danny. Like it was uh, it was a beautiful event. That is amazing. I love that for them. I love that for them. How many children did you have there at the event? Over 500. Oh my it was God. the largest mental health initiative that anyone has ever put together for teenagers. Because what happens is if you tell some, if you're like, oh yeah, we have a mental health event on this date and this time, there's going to be prizes and, and there's going to be music dancing. There is no teenager who goes to that. There is just, it just doesn't happen. You will never see an event attended by teenagers. But I was like, listen, we're just going to do this. Like the focus is the dance. The focus is there was prizes. We gave away money. We had like these competitions where kids would come up and do things. And we had tug of war. Um, you know, it was all girls would play tug of war. Then the boys would play tug of war and they, uh, everyone won money. I mean, it was, it was so fantastic. And um, yeah, I just, uh, it, it was, it was something special. It was so special. And um, you know, it was a, a place for kids to just be kids. And it was, there was no other parents. There's no little kids there. We had tons of volunteers, like from all uh, a bunch of different places. The Red Cross had like 20, 30 volunteers there, which was which was amazing. 
Um, and then we had all the therapists there too. It was, it was such a wonderful event, you know. That's amazing. I feel so lucky um, and blessed to have met you, Alfie, for more than one reason, you know, that you really are a voice for Lahaina, but that you did this, you're the guy that did this, and I'm sitting in front of you, and then to hear before the work that you did before, like giving your land, and, you know, you stepped up and out the second this happened, you offered your land, you you created rebuildmaui.org, you know, which we highlighted in our last broadcast, and like, you're the guy that did that, and then even though you offered your land, and you were letting people at that time like come and live in dome homes and little homes and you had all this great idea for trying to help families keep families together um and it was thwarted but but your heart is in such the right place i mean you're such a big deal you're such a big man you know you're a real great leader um and thanks to leah who introduced us um because i you know she reached out to me and she wasn't living directly in lahaina and so i interviewed her on rumble the first time and i said please find me somebody inside lahaina who saw the fire who can tell the truth um and then she she brought me to you so shout out to leah um again love yes. you i want to shout out your your viewers and i i'm i'm sorry i didn't i've never said this before in, in an email after our interview but we had a lot of donations come in and they were all from like overseas. And and then it didn't occur to me later that I was like, because we had some donations come in, but then I noticed that overwhelmingly in this period, right after the, the our interview, we had these, you know, really generous donations kind of flow in. And I just want to thank all of the viewers because, you know, I mean, we couldn't accomplish the things that we were able to do. Yeah, no, Danny, thank you. Like, what, your work is amazing. I know. I, I, know. I just want to just thank you. That makes me so happy because I know yeah. like, this channel, like it, the people, the beautiful people that come. I mean, there's great people, but there's just so many beautiful people that come and watch this channel. You know, watch me bang on and attack the systems in the world but their hearts are so big and I love that I'm so happy I didn't know that and I'm reacting to it because it makes me so joyful how amazing people are around the world and how much they love you know and they love their brothers and their sisters so and thank you for sharing that that's really really beautiful and thank you to each and every one of you who sends love to Lahaina wants to help and those of you that have and and please let's Keep it going, because obviously this man is still standing up. He's still helping. He's still a really good, you know, a good place. And, and his company is RebuildMaui.org. RebuildMaui.org. Alfie Baserto. So you can get a hold of him, guys. And you can come and, you know, be missionaries on the Haina. Help the people there. Um, Alfie, when the fire happened, and there's a lot of conspiracy theories about how it was started, what actually happened, what was the intention and thinking behind getting the people out of that prime land, if indeed that is a truth or not, we won't focus on that today. There's certainly enough conspiracy theories out there. I made a note um, after doing some research um, that there were, uh, on August the 8th, 2023, which incidentally is the Lionsgate portal, a very important portal date um, in our, you know, astrological calendar. And it's a, a spiritual uh, recognition. My own beautiful husband-to-be actually passed away on August the 8th. Um, so, I mean, he was a powerful man. He was a lion coming in and he was a lion going out. Um, it was reported that there were 101 deaths um, and they became uh, and they blamed it on environmental conditions. And then the attorney general of Hawaii uh, created a press release announcing the launch of the Lahaina Fire Comprehensive Timeline Report. What a mouthful. Sounds like the boring old 9-11 commission that was over 900 pages that they knew nobody was ever going to read. Um, and. But, you know, for, for us chatting here, um, you know, us, you and I taking the pulse of the ones who matter, taking the pulse, the temperature of the people of Lahaina, you know, how do they feel in general that they have been listened to, protected, taken care of? Like, how do the people of Lahaina that have lost everything, how do they feel in general about this? You know, there's there's people all, all over the map because, you know, obviously there's a lot of people who, who felt like they have not been heard. There are a lot of people who feel like they've been neglected. Um, and there are a lot of people who are angry. You know, those those there are a lot of people who, who um, held beliefs that, you know, they who were very unhappy with America coming in and, 
you know, and, and taking over. They, they were unhappy before the fire, but now after the fire, well, obviously those things have been sort of resurfaced for them. Um, you know, there's, there's just a lot of anger. There's a lot of despair. Um, and, and, and what I see a lot of is, um, and it's unfortunate, but, you know, I see a lot of people waiting and hoping that, that someone's going to come in and rescue them, you know, whether that's the government or, or some organization, you know, and I, I just, I don't believe in that. I don't, I don't want to, I don't ever believe that someone's going to come and rescue me, even though it may happen. Like, I feel like, you know, are the housing that we're creating is, is going to help rescue two families. But I just don't think as a general rule, that's a good plan. Like you have to make your own way. You have to, you know, make efforts to fix whatever situation you're in. And then I think good things start to happen to help kind of get you further along that path. But I think when I see a lot of people and, and I'm, and I feel, I feel, I don't want to harp on them too much because a lot of our people here are just beaten down. And sometimes you've beaten down so hard, you just don't move anymore. You know, you just don't have enough, any more fight in you. And that's just, and that, those are the, the people I feel so, so bad for, you know, that they just, they've, they've gotten the fight beaten out of them. And we're going to have another big, uh, a big exodus here because um, those who are Ill living in um, shelters right now, that, you know, that aid is going to stop here soon, right? And, and they're going to be, like, February is a date that um, a lot of the, the, uh, assistance housing assistance is going to end so we're going to see some really unhappy people you know terribly unhappy i know some friends who are refusing to rent their houses out to to fema because they're afraid that the people that are occupying them will choose to um just stay and um you know without paying rent and they're like i don't have the heart to kick somebody out you know who's living you know i don't i don't I don't have the heart to do that. Um, and so there are quite a few families who own homes who will not rent out their home to FEMA. You know, they'll rent it out directly to a family, but there's still, there's a lot of families who are scared that, you know, you won't be able to evict anybody because right. given the circumstances. Right. And I can understand that too. It's very difficult. Of course, they want their property rented out because that's part of their income. That's how they've created life. Nobody should get anything for free. But if FEMA are like paying for a while and then just ditching people, which is clearly the case, there's a timeline of how long they will pay. Then of course, the people aren't going to want to leave. What then go move on the street? What do they do? So it's, it's a catch to it. It's such a hard, hard situation to be in, isn't it? Yeah, it's really difficult for these for so many families. And I, what I just say is like, listen, you know, we can't expect the government to come and fix all our problems. I think that's a, I don't think that's the right mentality. I don't I don't think you can't expect anyone to come fix your problems, but you you need to start working on them, whatever that means. You know, just working on them, and I I think that's when good things start to happen for for us. And so you know that's that's been my message, and I'm I'm fortunate that. You know, if you didn't lose your house or lose someone, you can't really have that conversation, right? With with a with a fire survivor, but fortunately, that we you know we lost everything too, and so I have I am very eager to share that message. It's like, listen, guys, you have got because you said something earlier that you know you'll never we'll never have the life we had before. We'll just never have that. It's gone, and for and it's a lot like relationships you know if you if you destroy a relationship whether it's from lying or doing something silly you know you, you'll never have that relationship again and it's something i heard from esther perel who was another therapist who i really i really love her work too and she's like um she said that you know you you'll never have what you once had right it's gone it's destroyed it's done it's like but you can build something better and i believe that you, you can, we can, right? Because if, if you can't, if you don't believe that you can create something better, then what's the point? Why would you want to create something suckier? Why, why would you create something inferior? I mean, like, what's, who wants to march forward to that? But yeah. if you have the hope that, and, I, and I'm sharing this because, you know, that's my, it's been my perspective. It's like, 
hey, if you if you only agonize about what what you lost and and you're only gonna you only believe you can create something that's in more it's inferior to what you once had, then there's very little motivation to go forward and build. But if you're like, man, I really I really love the things that I met, I lost. I mean, I really miss that life. But I think I can build something better. And and it is with that kind of hope and that kind of optimism that I think will propel you into this better future. And I, and I, we've seen it done, right? I mean, um, I mean, uh, you know, like obviously, I don't know. We've all lost things, and you know, you've built this wonderful channel, and and uh, you know, I, I, yeah. I mean, I I see examples of it all all around us, you know. Mm, yeah, you know, um, thinking about the kind of air quality, um, the fact that they've scraped, as you said, the scrape. Now, I'm not a fire expert. Most people, of course, are not fire experts. But I, I imagine in my mind that, you know, there's a certain time period as well where things are less toxic. The plastics have gone down. The gases that were exposed, hopefully at this stage, a year later have gone down. And yet we're very much governed by and restricted by the authorities that put themselves in those positions to say, well, we're sorry, you can't move back here. I, I would push for the people to get second or third opinion, bring in actual people who aren't co commandeered by the government, by the local authority, and get to second or third, film it, put it out in the world, like push the blocks away, because is it real or isn't it? You know, we've heard so many things about, you know, the land grabs, and we know that's true. We know that people were offered pennies on the dollar. They were so desperate. They lost everything. They had to, they, they sold their houses. And as soon as it happened, there's so many of us around the world saying, that's a land grab, that's deliberate. You know, oh, the blue parasols didn't burn up. Let's not go down that road too much. But there is too much to turn away from. There is too much evidence of a corrupt level of happenstance around this fire. No matter what they try and do, no matter how much they try and put a bow on it, they can be quiet, sit down, because we the people, we see. We see it, we know it, we own it. Now, <clears throat> there's that. There's also the aspect that there's so many like strong men, young boys that were caught up in this and strong girls as well. You know, are any of them coming together in teams and starting themselves to clean and shift the debris, you know, like move the... Like, is it just like a complete shutdown there, Alfie? Yeah, yeah, because so there's 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 more than one um, thing that prevents people from returning to their land. So of course there's the debris and there's the the you know the the quality of the debris and the quality of the air. Um, but because their infrastructure is has been compromised, meaning the um, the water, the the sewage, and uh, electrical, but primarily the water and sewage, then you know, it's deemed uninhabitable because you can't, you know, if you've got nowhere to, to, you know, uh, dispose of feces, right. And they're, they're saying, sorry, you can't go back there. Right. Why aren't um, they sorting that out though, Harry? Uh, Alfie, sorry. I don't know why I called you Harry. Alfie, why aren't they sorting that out? It is clearly a toxic environment. It is preventing people who own the land and have lived there from moving back. So duh, it doesn't take much of a half an intelligent person. You get on the land, you take care, you clean it up, you make it safe. You know, it just, again, it looks like, no, well, we won't do, oh, this is the reason. You know, it's like for the last four flipping years, we've had to listen to, oh, yeah, because of COVID this and because of COVID that. It's like enough already. We, do, You know, we, it's just unacceptable on every level. You know, we, the people, need to question everything. Like, what is your thought on that? Why haven't they gone in? Um, I, up the well, because I... I mean, there's so many reasons why, like, you know, you, you mentioned COVID and I hope everyone realizes that COVID was just a big, you know, it was a big scam, you know, it was just a, a big old scam. And, and you know, I, I would hate to believe this, but there's, I often think that, man, there's a lot of people who would stand to benefit from purchasing all this wonderful land that's just oceanfront and, you know, a walk from the beach, like, there was a lot of people who who would and you know and, I, and there's organizations out there who you know the you know there's a lot of talk about big organizations like black blackrock who are right now you know really investing very heavily into um family you know single family homes and why isn't that you know that's just it's i think it's it's crazy but you know if i had a bunch of money not me personally i'm just thinking like if someone had a bunch of money and they wanted to buy really uh, choice land, being patient like this, right? And because that's the thing, when you don't have a lot of resources, time is not your friend, right? Like you can't, like people will get timed out. Um, 
in fact, you know, we have a mortgage on our land. We almost, we almost had to get rid of it. Like we, om- we, there, that's, it's, it is going to be there. Uh, the people with, with big pockets are going to buy it up. So this land that we were donating to, for people to use, we, we got a grant, um, and, uh, from Lowe's, I want to, uh, we got a grant from Lowe's that are helping us build the two tiny homes. It's, it's great. But at, at, until we, that the grant happened, that land was gone. It was just gone. And, you know, and we were figuring out how to just make our family work. So there's a lot of families who are going to, they're going to do just as we were doing where they're like, listen, I just, my land, it's gone. There's going to, it's going to happen where they just give up and they're going to let the bank take away their land hundred percent because you're just focused on survival. Yeah, That's all you are. Like, I'm going to get my kids in a good place. I want to go to school. I want them to go to school. I want to meet, I, I need to go to work. And all you do is focus on survival. Anything outside of survival is no longer important. 100 percent that's happening that's what happened with us and if it if it wasn't from uh this grant that we got um and and for us you know we're of course i'm still working and doing um and, and working the nonprofit, but i have i've had to go to work too because you know you just, you just have to make ends meet you just have to and so a lot of families they're finding themselves in these really unique situations where if you want it to work, if you want to stay in Maui, you've got to work your tail off right now. You just, you, you've got to do it. And some, some people are, are not mentally well enough to do that. Yeah. They just, they're not, they you won't know, return back to work. It's happened all over the world. So many times, specifically beautiful areas like this There's so many times where the indigenous have been moved off their land. The culture has been decimated and Lahaina, as we know, was one of the the most important um, royal uh, kingdom areas, you know, that energy, that portal energy has been there. It's the sacred banyan tree. Like it's been a, you can stand, apparently it was said to be that you could stand on that part of Maui and look across to um, to uh, Kauai. Um, and I'm not sure about Oahu too, but that's what I heard. Is that true? Yeah. So actually in Lahaina, it was, it was selected as the, you know, the, the, cap, the royal capital because you could overlook your kingdom. So really, you could see Oahu, you could see Lanai, you could see uh, Ko'olawe. Like you, um, I mean, it's it was a really rare um, place, right? Um, and what made it even more unique and special is that it it had um, fresh running water from the mountains. In fact, it still had fresh running water, you know, and it would fill up. Um, it would water, you know, the entire land and it provided water to all the people. So strategically, you know, when, you know, in ancient times, you always selected a place, you know, well, first of all, is access to water. That was typically number one, right? I mean, you just like, is there water here? Cool. We can live here then. Let's set it up. And yeah. so obviously they found it and they're like, okay, strategically, you know, does this make sense to be here? So it had one of the most favorable climates in all of Hawaii. It really does. You know, it just, it doesn't rain. It's protected, you know, from storms and winds and, and hurricanes because it had all these islands surrounding it. It's a very, very special place. And that's why it was selected as the Royal Capital. Um, and then, you know, it was, it was, the capital was later uh, relocated to um, Oahu because, you know, the, it, our island was just too small um, to support a, a a really a thriving you know capital and and i'm glad it moved because you know uh, you look at waikiki and oahu it's like a big city it's a really really big city it's lost that sort of um that island sort of feel you when you're there you feel like you're in like la that's the best way i can describe it you feel like you're in la it's really really busy actually um it was ranked that had the, the worst traffic in america you know and and that says a lot that little island it's crazy so yeah one area that i was so insistent last time we spoke because it just drove me nuts at that as soon as the fire happened it was all like there's two thousand children missing oh oprah winfrey stole them all you know all these things were coming out and i was very clear with you let's tell the truth there are not two thousand children missing but what was terrifying witnessing that was how the hypno hypnotized masses around the rest of the world there was an element where they they accepted that as truth they accepted that as truth and it's not their fault but it was a good opportunity 
opportunity for them to witness the social engineering of our entire planet, that we would be saying, oh, 2,000 children are missing, 2,000 children are missing, you know, and, and like it was going to be accepted because the grooming and the programming of all of us, the whole world, the MK Ultra, you know, by the deletes at the top, this is all part and parcel of how we, each individual, has been affected by programming, by environment, by, you know, social deprivation. There's so many different ways we could go here. Alfie, please tell us the truth. How many children ended up being physically missing? Well, that's a, that, it's definitely not 2000, you know, and, and um, you know, there, there were some children that were, that perished in the fire. Um, you know, the number, that number of, uh, of a hundred, it seems as more time goes by, it seems like that's, that is correct. Like it's, it is, I mean, it's, our island is so small. Right. And I and I've told people this is that Ireland is so small. If we were missing one kid, if one child was unaccounted for, you would hear about it. You know, if someone breaks up here, you hear about it. You go, oh, you hear so and so broke up. You know, it's like you just it's just so small. <clears throat> so if there's a child who's missing and unaccounted for, we we would have known, especially 2000 and 2000 kids on Maui. On, no, on the west side of Maui missing. That's like. You know, that's virtually like, you know, that's like a, a school of kids, you know, just wiped out. And um, so that's definitely not the case. And I do believe it's still more than 100 people perished. Uh, but in terms of just the kids, uh, no, no, I, it's I think that's an accurate count because there was there were parents who accounted for the for those kids. So but there's definitely people, you know, when I was <clears throat> I had a, a friend of mine. And he chooses not to talk about his experience anymore. And I don't blame him, but he was, he was in the, he had to jump in the water and he showed me some videos of him in the water. And he, you know, he would, he was saying goodbye to his family, you know, on his phone, you know, he's grabbed his phone and, he's, and he, and he said, Hey, and he did his best to like, he did his very best to like have a smile. And I mean, literally there's flames and smoke and people all around him. And he's like, Hey, Hey guys, I just want to tell you, I, I love you. You know, I love you. I, I, and I'm okay. I'm okay. I love you. And it's like, I just want you to know that. And, um, it was so sad. And he was, he was saying goodbye to his entire family. And, um, you know, and he told me, <clears throat> you know, he's like, you know, around me, there was kids who, who, who perished, who drowned. There was, there was, uh, old elderly who would drown. Um, you know, and he's like, there's, there was, <clears throat> There was uh, quite a few people around me who perished in that in the water with me. Um, you know, it's like I I literally, you know, I I literally handed um, a lifeless child to one of the firefighters out of the water, and uh, he's like that haunts me the most to this day. And he has children, um, and you know, it's he hasn't he hasn't talked about he he won't talk about that experience um, you know anymore. I, I've asked him if I could talk to him about it a little bit more, and. Um, I don't blame them. I think that's just really, it's really tough to digest, you know? Yeah, it, it's, it's awful. It's just beyond awful, awful. And none of us are ever going to forget the footage that we saw. None of us are ever going to forget seeing the long line of cars that were blocked by a police car. And I wondered to myself about that police person. Do they still live and work on the island? Were they hunted down? Were they truly deeply just under orders and had no idea of the amount of deaths that actually did, did occur be because that road was blocked? You know, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? What do you know to be absolutely true on that? I, I, I think that, I think that, that um, I do believe that they were following orders. I think the orders for bad orders you know like i think i think line cops you know myself being a, a police officer um it's rare that someone would just set up a roadblock very rare on your own in fact you normally wouldn't so uh you know my experience tells me he was he was ordered to to create a roadblock there and the fact that he held it or they held it down so um you know so so strongly it tells me that there were orders and um you know, it was such a big failure, and and those I think right now everyone is in, is in so much crisis that it's almost like they've just ignored the fact that that the that the police did that, and it it really it really infuriates me because you know I I had a friend who 
who um, was trying to drive and during right before, during the fires was driving into Lahaina and he he drove right up to the roadblock and he saw the roadblock and he saw the cars being turned around and had to drive back into Lahaina if they could. And he's, and I had to ask him, I was like, wait a second. I was like, you were at the roadblock? He goes, yeah. You know, he, he goes, I, I drove right up and they made me turn around and go back to Napili. Right. And I was like, you saw them with your own eyes. He goes, yeah, they, they, they weren't letting people out. And it's like, I didn't understand it, but I had to turn around. And it, it, that just it blew my mind that they would that they would do that because this is the other thing. They, well, the other thing about cops is if you know you're doing something wrong, like because sometimes you get orders and they're just they're wrong, you know, and, and you're expected to make um, decisions even if they're contrary to what the orders are. You can't just say, "Oh, my orders were this," and and you know, even though I knew this was dangerous, right? It's like these people these people have brains. They can see that, hey, blocking your escape is not good. So let these people through, you know. So I, I think, I think with everything going on, people have just decided to take their attention away from the police, and I, <clears throat> I think that's bad. And and not just because, not to just be vengeful. It's so that we just stuff doesn't happen again. Like if we don't learn from this, then the likelihood of something like this happening again is, is really high. You know, um, there was a major failure in our, in our emergency response, you know, from the police level, from the fire level, you know, um, you know, I get reminded of something might, my, my uh, there was, there was, you know, the, the firefighters responded to that fire in the very, in the very early stages and they responded to it. And I remember I heard them come out and then they left and they said it was almost all the way put out and there was a firefighter who said that she said that she said it was almost all the way put out and we had called to another fire that means it was not all the way out you know and she's taken that off of her her facebook since since then but people recorded it and it is crazy how do you leave a fire almost out because that's what happened. That fire later became what destroyed the rest of our 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 town. So, and wasn't it the case that the winds were extraordinarily crazily violent and very unusual on that day? You yourself were up at four in the morning. I mean, there was bashing. It was just very weird and eerie and very different. And wasn't it then said that the fire came down the mountain and yet it was apparently caused by um, electrical wires, frayed wires that had blown down in the wind. Was that their final, without reading that long, what was it called? The Lahaina Fire Comprehensive Timeline Report put out by the attorney yeah. in Hawaii. Wasn't that the final kind of you know, synopsis or conclusion? Um, <laughs> It, it was, and uh, I mean that's the story that they're 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 going with. But um, you said something there that I wanted to speak on. You said that um, it was the, the the fire. Repeat that again for me one more time, because there's something you you sparked something in me that I wanted to share. The um, it was called the Lahaina Fire Comprehensive Timeline Report, and it was put out by the Attorney General of Hawaii. And there was a press release um, announcing the launch of this uh, report. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's something else I wanted to share about that, but um, yeah, the so the oh, that's what it was. So you know, you mentioned about the winds, and we just had uh, two days ago. We had some really violent winds, right? And you know, um, there were I, I so there's a there's a page that I, I belong to all fire survivors and there are several parents on there who, um, who had extreme PTSD during those winds just, just happened. Oh. And, um, yeah, those winds of that day were very, very different. I mean, I had trouble standing in that wind. Um, you know, my, my, the entire, all the fencing around my house was blown over. And we, I mean, these were good, this is good fencing, you know, and it, they were they were blown to pieces and you know all the the shingles and, and all the roofs around me were being ripped off and um but 
you know, these a couple of the moms said in the group uh, in the last couple of days, they said, they're like, hey, um, I'm I'm leaving, you know, I'm we're leaving Maui because we can't relive, you know, a, a day like that where they just have, you know, strong winds. It's just too, too much. Nice. And I, it, yeah, there's a little child who was, um, it was one of these parks that were offering free services and um, the, the, the wind started blowing, it wasn't even heavy wind, but the wind started blowing and, and, and the child was crying hysterically and you can hear the mom, trying to come and it's like no 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 there's no fire no there's there's no fire it, it mm -hmm. it's just it's just a little bit of wind it's just a little wind mm -hmm. you know um so there's a you know the the wind is has played such a such a uh immense role and for a lot of people it's the source of a, a lot of pain and um i don't know that i don't know when that's going to get better for people but i i really feel for them you know, it's the wind more than anything. Like some people were, were questioning whether or not the fire fireworks for like Fourth of July or fireworks for New Year's is that going to you know bring back uh, bad memories? And it doesn't. It's the wind. The wind more than anything, because the wind was like you said when the morning it started, it was so heavy. Yeah. It, it that's really the source of a lot of pain. Have there been any weather reports warning? I mean, because if you're if you're <laughs> strong fencing is blowing down, and you're a you're a, you're a builder, you build these things like you're strong, you know what you're doing. If your fences are being ripped out the ground and the shingles are ripping off to off your roof, but there was no meteorological uh, weather update across uh, Maui or Hawaii to say, listen, there's really it. No, there were no warnings. It makes no sense. And that is why you then, and I want to apologize to the people affected that that I, I do run my mouth and I'm sorry, and I do trigger people. I don't mean to, I'm just so passionate for you guys. I want to do something in any way that I can to help you. And that's where I'm coming from, not to create upset, not to piss people off, not to you know make them feel I don't understand. I'm trying to, and, and trying to bring help and support and love and light on this. We're never going to let this go. I've been saying on several of my broadcasts, by the way, we're putting Lahaina back on the table, you know, so that we never, ever forget about it. We know we we get it sorted out. And I, I do want to invite people around the world to come to do tests, test the air, test the ground. You know, is it safe in their, their opinion for the people to go live back there? Because there's way too many people saying no to the people that deserve to be back at home in some regard or other, you know. And, and people around the world that are supposed to care about us, all the public servants, they all need such a kicking and a firing because their job is to serve the people. Everybody in government, senators, politicians, local authority, there isn't a single person in a role like that who isn't there to serve the people. One hungry, one cold, one homeless person, you failed. The administration needs to come down in whatever regard, mm. because they're not doing their job. And we can't let the authorities forget that. They need a wake up call, you know? And so the people, my darlings, you have the power. We, the people have the power. We stand shoulder to shoulder, we march forward. We say, no, this is what we're doing. We do it safely, we do it calmly, but we take back our power. We each get the, the ability to do that. And then you have to get off to work. I know it's early morning there in Hawaii. It's different here in England. No, 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 no. Checking you're not watching the no, time. No, I, 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 scheduled, I scheduled a lot of time for this. Okay, brilliant, brilliant, beautiful. Well, I mean, we've covered so much. And let me just um, make sure that, yeah, it's rebuildmaui.org. So if people <laughs> don't look underneath the broadcast, it's no Alfie Baserto, rebuildmaui.org. It doesn't get more simple than that, does it? Your address for your company and how people can connect with you, rebuildmaui.org. You know, you mentioned BlackRock. Um, you know, and we know that, that that's one particular company that owns more than half of the world. I'll say that again. BlackRock own more than half of the world. They, as a company, have more than enough and they put it through a charity or they do whatever, you know, to help this emergency situation. There's absolutely, and I, I get your point about not saving people because we do have to, but some people are just in such a traumatized state, they can't do anything. All they can think about is not being here. And we understand that. I'm a therapist. I mean, I've seen so many people over the years at that point. You know, so a company like BlackRock, 
who nobody trusts anyway, with all the stuff coming out of what they've done and how much they own and how dare they own so much. Um, it could, you know, buy land, clear land, you know, create safety for land, get the sewage um, organized, you know. Oh my God, it wouldn't take that much. Fly in crowds of people. You know, there are people around the world that will come. Yes, pay them. Emergency, sir. Like, it's just a joke. They're making you guys suffer longer and harder. It is so obvious. It couldn't be more obvious. Oh, we have to let the land fallow and all the gases and all the rest of it. I've lived in Costa Rica. I bought a house there, lived on a mountain. I see how that works. I see how they dig wells. I see how they have to look for gases. You can't pull the wool over the whole world's eyes. We're not having it, are we? I mean, <clears throat> you know, what's unfortunate is that, unfortunately, it does work for them sometimes. You know, I think of like of COVID and I'm like, because some people believe like, oh, no, they're not going to lie to us. They, you know, no one would lie to us. Wow. And I'm like, wow, the fact that you believe that nobody is lying to you is absurd that you still believe the way you do. <clears throat> you know, um, you know, I like that, you know, I love that you question everything. I love that you encourage people to question everything. I think it's healthy to question. I think it's necessary, especially in, in our times. Um, because, you know, if I do believe as you were alluding to that, you know, if, if, if there was a real desire to restore Lahaina, if there was a real desire to fix things here, it would have been done. Yes. You know, when you want something done, it gets done. Yes. You know, <laughs> you know, America has the resources, you know, I mean, we can do amazing things. But then when you look deeper and you're like, well, why hasn't anything been done there? Why aren't people allowed to return to their homes? Why aren't we doing more? Why aren't we having any homes built? It's been a year, right. <clears throat> you know, yeah. and then they have some story about, well, they have to do this and this and this other thing and that other thing. And there's just a way to do it. Ooh. And in the meantime, <clears throat> as I said, time is not your friend, especially if you have limited resources. They've got away with it, Alfie, for so long. They have treated people on our planet, especially the indigenous, especially the indigenous, like this their whole lives. If they don't rush to help, you know, if it was a different scenario, let's say it was a, you know, multi-million dollar real estate area, they'd be like, that'll be fixed by now. And we know it. It is fact. We know that. It's the truth. We've seen it enough times. We have so many examples. We also have enough examples across our world to recognize when a disaster happens, how long does it take? What happens? What, what about the tsunami in the Philippines? What about the tsunami uh, in Thailand? Like what happened to those people? Like the, the, the blueprint is there for how the rest of the world is treated when something like this happens. And in 2024, as a community of brothers and sisters of, of humanity across this planet, it is more than time that we stand and we say no. You know, it's like there's five people running the world compared to 500 million. That's literally a good mathematical statistic, you know, as an example, right? There's all of us and there's five of them, for example. You know, it's like, what, what are we scared of? What are we scared of? The people on your land, they couldn't be more down. They couldn't be more down. And at times, you know, when you're that down, that is the time when you hit your stride. And it isn't about being violent. It's about being Hawaiian. It's about finding that aloha. It's about being that spirit of your ancestors. It's about recognizing that precious land, Lahaina. It is one of the most sacred parts of land on the entire planet. Pretty much far none. I think most would agree. The Hawaiian Islands are in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. You got Australia billions of miles one way, Japan the other. There is something extraordinarily sacred and beautiful about those islands. And they deserve to be honored. They deserve to be held by the people, the ancient ancestral bloodlines, the energies, the portals, the everything about Hawaii and Lahaina in particular. So let's all come together as a unified collective. There are people watching this who've got deep pockets. You want a mission in life? Get your ass to Lahaina, make a difference, do something, record, bring scientists, clear the land, help. You can do it. If we did that one thing on Lahaina as a world family, imagine what else we could then do in other parts of our world. 
It takes one big thing like this for everyone in the world to go, oh my God, I'm snapping out of my hypnotic state and I'm recognizing the people that have run me and own me for generations, because it's, it's multi-generational what we're looking at around the world, the genociding around the world, the keeping the poor poor, for example, you know? And, and, and boom, you know, it changes the game. We lift the vibration, we make a difference. Guys, we can do this, we can do this. Yeah, no, I love that. And thank you, because I, I believe that, I believe that as, as well. I believe that when we band together and we encourage each other, we can do some wonderful things. And sometimes people just need to hear a message of hope. You know, they, they need to hear a message, an encouraging message where they can just keep going. It's it's um, it's um, only when you feel that there is no hope that you just stop fighting. And uh, that's a terrible place to be, you know, so. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah, well, I love your message. Uh, well, and I love you for being you and for being so vulnerable and for sharing, because you can see from the time that I interviewed you to this broadcast, like how much it's actually affected and, and added to breaking you down a little bit. You know, and you showed us that, you know, we can map that emotional journey that you've been through and your best friend and your wife and everyone that you've you've shared today and and yet you know I want you to know that you are loved and you are adored and you are admired because you're a giant among men for standing up in the way that you did but you need support you need to be heard you need to be seen so I pray and I hope and I wish and I call out to all of you out there to come and stand beside Alfie Baserto and others and that we can show the other people that are so broken down and lost that there is hope out there, there is love out there. They are worthy and their children are worthy and the generations are worthy and that we cannot allow Lahaina, the sacredness of Lahaina to be decimated, covered up, built upon and forgotten. No, they're trying to do it at the Giza Plaza as well. The Giza Plaza in Egypt. They're actually trying to, a friend of mine, William uh, William Brown, who has bought a little stable block right on the Gaza Plateau. The, the, the Egyptian government are trying to force him to sell it to them. They're intimidating. They're knocking everything down around. He's got this one little tiny stable block that he's growing flowers and plants out of to bring some kind of harmony to this area and the rest of the area they're trying to uh buy up all, all the land kick all the local people out who've lived there for multi-generations same thing because they want that land and they want to build hotels they want to make it you know it's like stop we have to you know the reset the the beautiful loving the uh, indigenousness the ancestral bloodlines the energetic frequencies that our our world world harmonizes with like it's happening around the world so i'm saying for lahaina let's make it a a focal point a portal point and and i know that we can do something beautiful and amazing you know and help your beautiful beloved neighbors feel more hope feel more loved you know, so guys out there, I want to invite you again, connect with Alfie, rebuildmaui.org. And if you can do something, actually do something about this, then please do it. You know, and, and um, they include Maui, they say, as part of America, because when the American government came in and decimated the ancient royal Hawaiian kingdom in the 1800s, late 1800s, uh, the American government took it over, took land off the local indigenous. I mean, did the most awful, awful things uh, and still do to this day. Uh, but there is a lot there. So if you go into America, I think you can stay for like 90 days. But you can go to Hawaii because it's considered America. I mean, it's not, of course, but they took it and they call it the 50th state. For those of you that don't know, I lived on Hawaii Hawaii too. I'm very, I've been to the island so many times. Like it's part of my heart too. Um, you know, I lived on Kauai um, and I've been to Maui and Lahaina, Lanai and Molokai and other parts. And it's just a very special, unique landmass in the middle of the ocean. So Alfie, my love, please share your final words to the audience and the people that will see this. Yeah, well, first of all, just thanks for having us back or having me back. And thank you for being so interested in what's happening here on, in Lahaina. There's still so much work to be done here. And um, I thank you for allowing me to share, you know, the, the status. And thanks for allowing me to share, you know, what, um, you know, what we're doing here with, with, with kids and with, with mental health. And, um, um, you know, a message to, to any one of your, your viewers is, 
you know, my email is, is on my website if they want to reach out. Cause I feel like, I feel like there's a lot of, especially men who, who, um, who may suffer from, you know, some, something like I did, you know, and, um, you know, I feel free to reach out or if people want to reach out and ask about, uh, flow fest and they want to do something like flow fest in their area, I'd love to help them and guide them through because we were able to reach out to, you know, hundreds and we have another flow fest planned, uh, for late August, early September. And we, we hope to, um, we believe we'll have a thousand teenagers there. And it's, it's very, very unique to have a thousand teenagers show up for a mental health oh. event, you know, it's just insane. And so we're, we're really, really excited about that. And, you know, I think teenagers needed mental health, um, attention before the fire, you know, that, that nothing drastic needs to happen. If you, we look back into all of our childhoods and we think, man, I would have benefited from talking to somebody, you know, it's like, wow, I could have. It would, you know, I, I needed, a, everyone could have said that, right? Like they needed a little help. And so, you know, if someone, if anybody wants to reach out and ask about how we, how we went about, um, you know, accomplishing that, I would love to help someone do a flow fest in their area. It doesn't have to be in America, be some other country, you know, and, um, you know, kids are still kids and kids love music. Kids love to have their own stuff. And um, yeah, it would be an honor to help somebody uh, achieve that. And um you know, you obviously have some really compassionate viewers and I'm, I'm I'm blessed to have been connected with you and, and, and your audience. And so just thank you very much for all the wonderful um, things that your, your viewership has extended to us. And it has been beautiful. And especially in the early days after that, um, you know, the first interview, we had that, that pouring out of, of, of donations that in a time that it was really, really, really helpful so, you know, we appreciate that very much. So again, thank you for that. It was very, very kind. Um, and yeah, if anyone wants to connect with me um, on a personal level, just reach out. I'd be happy to to connect with somebody. I think your your viewership is, is they're pretty outstanding. So thank you. And thank you, Danny, for having me. I really appreciate you. It's been lovely. Thank you, Alfie Baserto. And I, I, I'm very honored that and I, I receive your words and thank you. And I return them a thousand million fold. Uh, you're a good example of a good human, Alfie. You really are. And I know there is nothing in you that was looking or seeking or searching for recognition at all. You're just simply being a good, loving, strong human and protecting and, and reaching out. And I think something so beautiful with the children, the teenagers, because God love them, that's one of the most misunderstood and overlooked groups of, of young people that imagine that, you know, around the world, there are communities that see this, for example, and they have their children reach out to the similar age children in Lahaina, you know, and let them be seen, be heard and let them receive love from other children. And maybe they do like live hookups, you know, school to school and, you know, people giving them encouragement and say we see you we're so sorry that that happened we send you our love and you know we sing a song for you or just something where we bring the global community together it is so easy to do that it really is I had one more thing on my mind that I didn't want to forget now it's gone out of my mind uh, but it was something to ask you or to re to remind people uh, forgive me um it is gone but did you have you, something you else know what I do now uh, well while you try to recollect that I, I'll share something about about kids and you know something with teenagers that's been very unique is that um when at that age in teenagehood yeah they feel they have a responsibility to be um to to behave as adults so when trials uh, enter their life uh, by way of the parent or, or whatever if it if a big trial a, a big event enters the family's life a lot of times um, teenagers take it upon themselves to uh, be more adult-like. So they, they'll say to themselves, oh, well, you know, mom and dad are having a hard time. You know, I, I'm just going to kind of suck it up here. I'm not going to say anything. They're, they're struggling and I'm, I'm going to do more. And, um, well, well, but, but unfortunately, that, that doesn't serve that teenager very well at all because they are, um, they're, in essence, they're, they're lifting a lot more than they're they're uh, mentally capable, emotionally capable of lifting. You know, I mean, I'm I'm not a I'm not a therapist. You know, Danny, I'm 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 just speaking from you know personal experience and what and and I'm seeing what I see. You know, and 
And so, you know, they have a lot of kids who are walking around with a lot of pain and a, and a, and a lot of weight on their shoulders. And um, they have no avenue of of um, kind of putting that down somewhere. And um, and so I think it's just it's so important that that's why I felt it was so important that we we offer some help to these kids that just say, hey, you know what? You know, like like you've been saying, it's like, you know, you're you're being seen, you're being heard. And, and we're going to, you're going to be surrounded by a, a ton of other kids who are just like you, you know, because as a child, as a species, we all just want to fit in, right? Like I'm talking like just as a species, we all have this strong desire just to fit in and kids, I think in the very big, in the early stages, you know, you, you just, you want to fit in so bad. Um, you know, you, 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 you interpret it as a, as a, a matter of survival, you know, if I don't fit in, I'm not going to survive. And so, so that's why I think it's so important that we offer things for kids to do that are just for them. And they feel like they're like, Oh, finally, I'm around my own people, right? Their people are just teenagers. They're, it's not the color of their skin. It's not where they're from. Cause they can, when they look around, they're like, Oh yeah, these are all teenagers, all my people, you know, doesn't matter if they're from Hawaii or not. It's like, <clears throat> there's something about when kids, they'll realize they're like, I'm surrounded by my people. And um, it's it's a beautiful thing to see. And um, I would love to see that, you know, maybe this would spark interest in in other areas where, you know, um, there aren't enough things for teenagers to do that are healthy and wholesome and very, very safe. So that's that's my hope. That's my dream. Well, that's beautiful. And again, the reminder that if every single person, you know, over the age of 25 or even 30 could could take a moment to think back and remember how painful and awful and ghastly the teenage years can be, the shame, the humiliation, the hormones, the growth of our bodies, the hair, the everything, the things that happen to us. And we feel so alone, so isolated. So we gravitate towards other teens because there's something spoken or unspoken conscious or unconscious that we know they're going through something similar by the very definition that that you know that we're a similar age and we've got to remember the teenagers in particular need so much attention and like you said some of them just put down their feelings which causes emotional paralysis then they're focusing on the trauma of their younger ones their parents they're trying to be the man of the house the woman of the house they're trying to take care they're under so much stress so much pressure so yeah so more kindness to them is is definitely needed yeah and then that what happens is that if it goes unaddressed like like it was when i was a child it it's going to resurface in 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 future relationships it's going to resurface in 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 the future for these kids because it never gets it never gets resolved and unfortunately as a child you don't have the the the, the wherewithal the experience to realize that this thing that happened here is the reason why these bad things are happening here for them now you know it it's all connected and because no one's ever shown them that that hey you know when you when something goes unresolved that was traumatic that was significant you know you were you were neglected right because you know the abuse can be come from neglect or it can come from something very overt like you know like pain and suffering like you know being beaten you know or sexually abused so so these kids are experiencing one of those things they're either getting neglected or they're being overtly abused and and it's unfortunate that they that you know with everything going on that's crazy to me like where i'm thinking like we just experienced a huge fire and we're just we we're experiencing pain at a level that we that you know many uh communities have never experienced and we don't have like resources and events just for kids like it, it like blows my mind like why isn't there more being done even for parents like why aren't we having a, a some event like this for you know that, that specifically targets you know, adults and help them navigate through this difficult time. You know, just a bunch of broken people walking around, you know, and. Right, exactly. And, and Alfie, it took you, <laughs> it took you, you're one person in this whole decimated area of hundreds of people. That's the, that's the point. It's the wake up call to everyone watching this. 
you know, that can help, that can do something, you know, and, and receive a healing themselves for something they're trying to heal. Not that you do it for that reason, but it does happen. I want to make another appeal to people out there with bigger channels than me. Please stop protecting the content on your channel. If you've got a channel that reaches hundreds of people, thousands of people, please invite Alfie on your channel. I can't believe it, Alfie. I see it every day. People aren't sharing. They're in a position to broadcast to the planet, to bring more people into to unity, to unification, to love, and they don't do it. And it's very selfish, and that's a judgment, and I own it, and I don't care. Because, you know, if you're lucky enough to have a huge platform, please, my darlings, please use it. If you've got a massive wallet, you've got a, a couple of quid you can spare, like really a couple of quid you can actually spare that's not going to hurt you, then do it. Feel good about yourself. Feel good about life. Well, Alfie, I know we could keep going and going. My God, um, I'm thoroughly emotionally spent uh, because I know that this is going to do so much, but also bring a lot of people watching it to emotion too, because you can't not be moved just by the fire itself, by listening to you, by listening to your very personal story. Uh, but that one story that you're trying to heal that part in you, Look what it did. Look, it was a, uh, the Maui Flow Fest was created from that. So again, some good has already come out of a terrible trauma that you suffered in childhood. So thank you, Alfie Baserto, love you. And I just wanna give my, my love to the people of Lahaina, to everybody, to the ancients, to the ancestors, to everybody connected to that part of the world. Um, the aloha is strong. The aloha is strong. My name is Danny Henderson. <laughs> These are happy tears. Sending you love from my heart to yours. And we'll see you soon. Aloha. Thank you, Danny. Aloha. Thank you.